Carter. Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're here. On this exciting Sunday morning, we begin by singing together one of the most beloved hymns of all time, How Great Thou Art. Hymn number 10 is our hymn. Stand with us as we join our voices in song, How Great Thou Art.
Good morning. As we read in God's word in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through one's, the obedience of the one, the many will be, be made righteous. As we observe baptism, we see that it is a matter of obedience. Our Lord was obedient in his death on Calvary's cross. <laughs> We, th we thank the Lord for the word buoyancy. <laughs> it's my privilege this morning to baptize Garrett Strickland. I was able to, to mentor him through men's group and share with him some. And I would like to ask any of his friends or family to rise in his honor to observe this. Garrett, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Upon that statement... In obedience to the commandment of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may be here and you have failed to be obedient in baptism that you may be a believer. Uh, we will give a time of invitation at the end of this service, you'd be welcome. Also, you may be here and you may not know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. All that we do in this church is to proclaim the gospel and disciple the followers. So when the invitation is given, please be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that we can gather here freely today. Uh, we thank you for this country in which we live, Father, for the freedom that we celebrated this last week as a nation, Lord. Uh, we know that this freedom came at a very high price, Father, one that was paid with blood. Uh, even more, Father, we ask you and we thank you for the freedom that's available uh, through Jesus, Lord, the freedom from sin. And Lord, we ask today that if there's anybody here uh, who has not experienced that spiritual freedom that today will be the day of salvation, Lord. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for the exciting day for our church, Lord. We ask you to speak through Brother Peyton, Father, as he speaks to us through your word. We ask you help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers, and to be found faithful in all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes when you pray for a situation from the very beginning, you can trace God's hand at work in the entire process, and it reaffirms what you know about the power of prayer. And I believe that is a true testimony of our search committee this morning. But even when the situation is hard to understand, like the death of a loved one or the loss of a job, and you're not sure what God's plan is, the most important thing we can do is to obey that situation in prayer. So back in March, when I began to plan for the summer, I prayed and asked the Lord to help me choose the exact songs the choir needed to sing each Sunday throughout the summer. Well, 12 weeks ago, as I began to plan, we had no idea that on this very morning, on July 7th, we would have Peyton and Jordan Lee here in view of a call, but the Lord knew Twelve weeks ago, I believe with all my heart that it is not a coincidence that back in March, the Lord directed me and I wrote down that on Sunday, July 7th, that the choir would be singing Bow the Knee, a song about prayer. What better place to start this morning with excitement in the air, with our hearts in one accord as we begin this new ministry together. Our choir voices it this morning. But I believe our entire church wants to tell you, Peyton and Jordan Lee, that we believe in you, we love you, 
already. And we want to know, want you to know that we are committed to pray for you as we begin this journey together. Listen prayerfully as our choir sings, Bow the Knee.
Good morning. That is, that is such a, a powerful song. Remind me of an opportunity I had to go to Brooklyn Tabernacle. And the pastor reminded us that the success that the Lord has brought to Brooklyn Tabernacle is about the knee on Tuesday night. They have Tuesday night prayer meeting. So Mitch, bow the knee. Thank you for being here. We welcome you uh, in this uh, exciting day. If you're here and you're a visitor, we'd like to get to know you better. We have a portion on our worship guide that you can fill out, tear off, and drop it in, a, in our offering plate or give it to one of our leaders. We would really like to get to meet you. And one way we'd like to do that is right now that we would ask everyone to stand and greet those around you. Stand with us as we sing together. How great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And remain standing as we sing together that great gospel hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee, and then I Love You, Lord. My Jesus, I Love Thee. Let's sing together. My Jesus, I love thee, I know. Thou art mine, for Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul rejoice, take joy. Hey. 
lift our voices as we sing together. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we do love you this morning, and we thank you so much that you loved us, and so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for us, and also, God, that you love us so much that you bestow blessings upon us every day. At this time, we return just a small portion of everything you've entrusted to us. But God, we ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings, and that they would be used wisely to the furthering of your kingdom here in Prattville and all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There came a sound from heaven, it was like a mighty rushing wind. It filled their hearts with singing. and gave them peace within. The prophet gave this promise. He said, the Spirit will descend. And from your inner being, a river with no end. that frees the soul from sin. Come to this water, for there is There came a thirsty woman, 
She was drawing from a well. You see, her life was ruined and wasted, and her soul was bound. Thank you, Ralph and Mitch and church. What a great worship time we've had so far this morning. And over the past few weeks, you've heard plenty enough from me talking. So without any delay, I want to welcome, for on behalf of the search team and the church, Peyton Hill to bring God's word for us this morning. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. So good to be here. If you have a copy of God's Word, let me invite you to take it out, open it up, and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. While you're turning there in your Bibles, let me just say that it is such a privilege and a joy to be here to open up God's Word with you. In so many ways, today is the culmination of many months and even years of prayer. Uh, you have been praying. Your pastor search team has been praying. Brother Travis and Miss Arlinda have been praying. My wife Jordan Lee and I, we have been praying. And now here we are opening up God's Word for the first time together. I, I do want to say that I believe that every single one of us stands upon the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And so this morning, as we open up the scriptures, I am very aware that I am standing on the shoulders of a man who has faithfully shepherded this church, 
who has faithfully preached and taught God's word, who has faithfully led this congregation for 30 years. I am so grateful for Travis Coleman and what God has allowed him to do here in this church. And so even though they're not here this morning, before we read God's word together, can we just celebrate the Lord's goodness to this church through Brother Travis and Miss Orlinda this morning? Well, if you do have your Bibles open, let me invite you to stand to your feet to honor the reading of God's holy, perfect, without error word, beginning in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, and they each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices. And the temple, it was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined Because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. And in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed. And your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This is God's word. Let's go to him in prayer for help this morning. Our great and sovereign God, as we come to your book this morning, we pray that you would give to us what we do not have in and of ourselves. We pray that by your spirit, you would give us eyes to see your glory revealed in the face of your son, Jesus Christ. God, by your spirit, would you give us ears to hear the voice of Christ in this text. And God, by your spirit, would you open up our hearts and help us to believe and obey this good and perfect word. All for your glory. And for the good of First Baptist Church in this community. Amen. Amen. Well, you can have a seat. Now, I'm not a dreamer. I mean, of course, I have goals and ambitions for my life. But what I mean is, I'm not the type of man that can tell you much about the dreams that I had last night. In fact, I'm not even sure if I ever dream. Because if I do, I can never tell you about them. But that's not the case for my wife, Jordan Lee, and my oldest daughter, Harper. They can tell you everything about their dreams. And in fact, normally, on a morning in our home, you can find them huddled up around the breakfast table discussing the intricate details of last night's dreams. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, I woke up. I made my way down the stairs into our kitchen like normal. I was prepared to kiss my wife and get a cup of coffee and then go to my special chair where I do my Bible reading and time of prayer in the morning. And so it was a normal day, and as I went to do that, I I gave my wife a little peck on the lips, but I noticed that her lips were a little bit more tense than normal. And then as I was getting my cup of coffee, I could just see her out of the corner of my eye glaring at me. And then as I went to my chair and I was reading my Bible and I was having a time of prayer, I could just kind of feel the tension in the room. And so I said, baby, are you okay? And she said, no. I said, babe, um, what's wrong? Did I do something? She said, yes, you did something. I said, babe, I've only been awake for like three minutes. What in the world have I done? And she said, well, last night in my dream you did something awful and I don't want to look at you right now. Now, you and I know that I I didn't do that awful thing, but it had been so real to her, it took her about five minutes before she warmed back up to me. So then I just kissed her, got another cup of coffee, and started my Bible reading all over, and everything was fine. 
Now, I love hearing her stories and my daughter's stories about their dreams because they're so vivid, and I personally have never experienced that. Well, we, we approach Isaiah chapter 6, and we're given the bird's eye view uh, of a dream. And really, it's not a dream like you and I might have had last night when we were sleeping. It's more of a vision, a vision that is so real and so vivid that some theologians and some scholars think that what Isaiah actually saw was not a vision at all, but it was actually the real thing. We're given a time stamp of this vision in verse 1. We're told that it was in the king, the year that King Uzziah had died. Now this was a big deal for the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah because Uzziah had been king for 52 years. Now, living in America, we're used to presidents being the leaders of our country for four or maybe eight years, of course, unless your name is Roosevelt. Can you imagine a king for 52 years? And during those five decades of leadership, Uzziah had brought a lot of prosperity and wealth and military and political peace to the kingdom of Judah. And so the people went into full-on panic mode when King Uzziah died. Uh, The foreign armies of the Assyrians had been creeping into the land of Judah for quite a long time. But as long as King Uzziah was on the throne, the people knew they'd be okay. But now he was gone and the people went into panic. What are we going to do? Are the Assyrians going to come get us? Uh, Who's going to lead us? How are we going to know what to eat for breakfast in the morning? Our king is gone. And so Isaiah, in the midst of this crisis, does what a lot of people do in the midst of crisis. He went to the temple, presumably to play, to pray. He went to the place where the presence of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. He went into the temple, the place where the priests labored, offering up sacrifices on behalf of the people. I remember the Sunday after 9-11. I remember that our nation was in such panic because of what had happened in New York and Washington that that Sunday most churches across America were packed to the brim. Uh, People that had grown up in church but had walked away from church, they came back. Uh, People that had missed the Sunday before, they made sure not to miss that Sunday. And people who had never been to church before, they thought that would be a pretty good time to start. And so Isaiah, like many of us, during a time of crisis, decides to go to the temple. But when he gets to the temple, he's not given what most of us expect him to be given. You see, if I was God, and I'm not, I would have told Isaiah, hey, it's going to be okay. Let me tell you about your new king. Uh, Hey, Isaiah, don't worry. Uh, Let me tell you how I'm going to take care of the Assyrians. Uh, Hey, Isaiah, I don't want you to fret. I've got a plan, so let me give you my strategy and my methods for carrying out my plan. No, that's not what Isaiah sees at all. Rather than God giving him a strategy or a plan, God gives him a vision of himself. As if God is saying, in the year that the human king died, Isaiah, I'm going to show you the king that will never die. That in the year that the human king that you've trusted in for years and years as a people, in the year that he went away, I'm going to show you the king that you can always trust in. And we're given a picture of this vision. And in this vision, we're really given a full four, fourfold pattern. Uh, we're first given a vision of the glory of a holy God. Then we're shown the heinousness of our own sin. Then we see God's gracious salvation provided through a substitutionary sacrifice. And then finally we see the urgency of God's mission. Isaiah makes his way into the temple and we're told in verse 1 that he sees a vision of the glory of a holy God. Isaiah says, and I saw the Lord. Now, let me tell you how I know that we didn't get what I just read because none of us said. (gasps) But up to this point in Scripture, to see the Lord was to have a death warrant. To see the glory of the Lord was to drop dead. 
Uh, Moses had wanted to see the Lord, and God was like, Moses, you can't handle that. So I'm going to put you in a rock. I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to walk by you, and you can just kind of look at the back stuff and just know that you can't handle everything else. Yet Isaiah, for some reason, is giving the ability to gaze upon the Lord in a moment of crisis, in a moment of uncertainty. What does the Lord do? He shows up, and he shows himself to be the holy God. I saw the Lord, and when I saw him, verse 1, we're told, he was seated high and lifted up. A picture of the Lord's sovereignty, a a picture of the fact that he is in control, he has all authority. And we're told that the hem of his robe filled the temple. Uh, Some of your translations may say the train of his robe. Uh, Now, as a pastor, I've had the opportunity to stand in many beautiful worship centers like this one and to see many beautiful brides walk down the aisle to be presented to their groom. And without exception, every single bride that I have ever had the opportunity to conduct her wedding, she has worn white, she has been beautiful, but she has not come alone because as she makes her way down the aisle, there is a train following her. Now, what is that train for? Is it just to give the maid of honor something to do to help her get up the steps? No. It's to point to her majesty, her glory, her beauty. That she's somewhat of the the centerpiece of that moment as she's being presented to her husband. We gaze and we stand and we look at her in her honor. Well, she is simply following a long tradition of kings and queens throughout history who show up and to declare their majesty, they're wearing robes of great length. When the Lord comes into the temple, we're told that his robe is not just so long that it's trailing behind him, but it fills the temple up, pointing to his glory and to his majesty. And we're told in verse 2 that he comes accompanied with seraphim who are flying around him and they're declaring a song. Now these seraphim, the plural word for seraph, are angelic beings, but they're not angels. I mean, if these were angels, you know what Isaiah would have called them in the Hebrew? Angels. But that's not what he called them. He called them seraphim, which literally means burning ones, angelic type beings, but there must be some type of difference. We just don't really know what it is because they don't show up anywhere else in Scripture. Other than later in Revelation, there seems to be an allusion to them, but the word is not actually used. And we're given a little bit of a picture of their physical makeup. They got six wings. Now, was the Lord just getting carried away with himself when he was making them, thinking, hey, if two wings looks good, why not four? Four wings looks great. Let's just add another pair. No, the Lord doesn't work that way. He's purposeful. He's intentional. Meaning, though we may not understand why there are six wings, we know there's a purpose behind it. Uh, Could it be that with the two wings they're covering their face, they're covering their face to protect themselves from continually being in the presence of a glory-filled God? Uh, Could it be that they're covering their feet to protect their feet from the holy God? Do you remember Moses during those years of shepherding in the land of Midian? He went up on a mountain and he looked over in the corner and he saw a burning bush. And there was a voice coming out of the bush, the Lord himself saying, Boy, you better get those shoes off because you're on holy ground. Moses takes his shoes off because he's in the presence of the Almighty And now here are the seraphim covering their feet because they know that they're in the presence of the sovereign holy God. And with two wings, they fly to do the bidding of the Lord. Whatever the Lord sends them to do, that is what they do. And we're told that the seraphim, as they're flying and as they're doing the Lord's bidding, in verse 3, they have a one lyric song that they're singing. Uh, Some of us talk about 7-Eleven songs. You sing the same seven lyrics 11 times. Apparently, the seraphim don't have a problem with that because there's only one word that they're saying back and forth. Holy, 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 holy. It's almost like you're at a football game. And one side is cheering one color and the other side is cheering the other color. But these are seraphim and they're calling back and forth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of armies. 
Now, what does it mean to be holy? Uh, Sure, the holiness of God speaks to his purity. It speaks to his being without error. It speaks to his majesty. But more than that, to be holy is to be set apart, different, other. Our God is not like us. Though we have been made in his image and there are things about us that resemble him as his creatures, he is not like us. He is altogether different than us. And don't you forget it. He is holy. He is not just holy, but he is holy, holy. He he is not just holy, holy, but he is thrice holy, 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 holy. Why is Isaiah repeating himself here? Well, during your Bible reading this morning, because I know every one of you woke up and at an early time in the Bible with the Lord, I'm sure that some of you uh, underlined a word or maybe a phrase or a verse that stuck out to you. Uh, or maybe some of you tomorrow morning, uh, you've got one of those jobs where you send a lot of emails and, and you're telling people that there's a meeting coming up. And so you don't want them to be late to the meeting. So you put the meeting date and time in bold just so that they'll make sure they see it because they're going to skim the rest of it. Or, or maybe you italicize things or you, or you double underline things to point out that this is, this is important. You want to really highlight this. Well, when Hebrew, there, there were no italics. Uh, There were no bolding that was simply repeating itself, which is why all throughout the Scripture, you will find that words will be repeated in order to give them emphasis. And in fact, Jesus himself would do this. Jesus would speak and he would say, truly, truly, or, or sometimes verily, verily, depending on your translation. What does that mean? It's simply Jesus trying to point to the fact that what he's about to say is really important and you need to pay attention. But there's only one word, only one attribute of God in the Bible that is taken to the third degree. And it is that God is holy. Never does the Bible say that he is love, love, love. Never does the Bible say that he is mercy, mercy, mercy. Never does the Bible say that he is just, just, just. Is he love? Is he mercy? Is he just? Yes. Why is the emphasis on holiness? Because God's holiness is the supreme attribute by which all other attributes of God flow. God is a holy God who has a holy love. We love, but he loves altogether different than we do. God is a God of justice, but his justice is a holy justice altogether different than our justice. He is a holy, holy, holy God. And the seraphim are always before the Lord. When you and I were sleeping and drooling on our pillows last night, when we were in Sunday school, when we are in this room, before the Lord God Almighty, there are the burning ones that are crying out before the Lord God that he is holy, he is holy, he is holy. And we're told That as the seraphim are crying out before the Lord God in verse 4, that even creation itself begins to quake. That the foundations of the temple begin to rattle. That smoke fills up the temple as if the Lord God in all of his holiness has come down. Do you remember when the Lord God met on Mount Sinai with Moses? What happened? That whole mountain began to shake. Smoke started flowing from the mountain, and the people of Israel on the outside of the mountain, they got a little worried. (laughs) This God who just brought us out of Egypt, he's not a God to mess around with. And this is the same God who was appearing before Isaiah in all of his holiness and grandeur. And as Isaiah looks upon the glory of this holy God, as he looks into the mirror of this God, Isaiah sees the heinousness of his own sin. He begins to internalize as he gazes upon the Lord. He says, woe is me. Now, sometimes we just read that and and we move on because sometimes we may not understand exactly what's happening. Uh, Yes, Isaiah says that he's ruined, he's devastated, but but what is the woe language? 
Well, the prophets were, were given the authority by God to often offer blessings or curses. So they would often offer blessings on peoples and on nations, saying, blessed are you. Uh, Jesus even did this in the Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, these are blessings. But the prophets were also given the opportunity to offer cursings as well. Literally judgment upon nations and upon peoples. And the way that they would offer these cursings is using the language, whoa. For example, Jesus looked at the Pharisees and the scribes and says, Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes. You're nothing but whitewashed tombs. Cursed are you. But here, in a shocking turn of events, Isaiah doesn't call a cursing upon the people. He doesn't call a cursing upon another nation. He says, Woe is me. As if when we get a picture of the glory of a holy God, the only proper response is that I deserve to be crushed under his glory. Because he is, he is holy. He is altogether different than me. He is other than me. He is not like me. I have sinned before this God. I see my rebellion. And the prophet begins to say, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. Why would he single that out? What's the most important thing for a prophet? A mouthpiece of God. His lips, his tongue, to speak the words that God gives him. What's the most important thing for an athlete? His muscles. What's the most important thing for a carpenter? His or her hands. What's the most important thing for a prophet? His lips. And Isaiah is confessing, in light of the glory of God, he's confessing that even the best thing about him, even his most gifted area, even the thing that gives him his worth is unclean. He's dirty. He's filthy before a holy God. And not only is he filthy, but he knows that he, as a prophet, is the best man in the land. And if he's filthy, that means everybody else is filthy as well. And notice what the text tells us. We're told in verse 5 that he calls the curse upon himself. He knows that he's ruined. He has unclean lips. He dwells among a people of unclean lips. And then he gives us the reason why. Because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies, or the Lord of hosts. Isaiah sees God. And when he sees God, he sees himself properly. We don't see ourselves correctly until we see God. God in the right way. And when we see God in the right way, we see ourselves, who we are, we are sinners. That we were made in the ends of God to glorify Him, love Him, walk in obedience before Him. We have rebelled and we are ruined and deserve cursing because of it. But does the Lord leave Isaiah like that? Absolutely not. Because we now see God's gracious salvation provided through a substitutionary sacrifice. Verse 6, the Lord God sends one of the seraphs, and he flies to Isaiah, and in his hand he is holding tongs. And between those little tongs, there is a burning coal that is placed upon Isaiah's lips. The very place that Isaiah has just confessed his sin, the very place that Isaiah has confessed is the filthiest, the very place that shows the access to Isaiah's heart, that is the place that the Lord through the coal cauterizes and redeems through a painful process. Now, can you imagine that pain? I mean, when I was a middle schooler, I did some silly, dumb things, like go to bonfires and take out hot coals and play hot potato with them and see if I could do it without getting burnt. This is a hot coal. Where did the coal come from? It came from the altar in the temple. What happens at the altar in the temple? That's where the priests, for decades and decades to this point, would come, and they would offer up substitutionary sacrifices on behalf of the priests and on behalf of the people. And if the coal that just came from the altar is hot, that means that a sacrifice had just been consumed. 
the fire was hot enough to burn up the ram or the lamb that was offered, and now it's being placed on Isaiah's lips, as if the Lord is saying, I have accepted the sacrifice on your behalf. Your sin has been atoned for, but now I'm going to apply that forgiveness to you, and I'm going to go to your place of greatest need, to your lips. And the seraph speaks out and says, Isaiah, your iniquity is forgiven. Uh, the guilt that you sense because of your sin is gone. You said, woe is me. You called a curse upon yourself. And Isaiah, that's a proper response, but that's been removed. Uh, Isaiah, your sin has been atoned for. Uh, you know that your sin deserves judgment. That there's a payment for your sin. But that sacrifice was offered in your place. Your, your sin has been paid for. And this coal is a sign that you're accepting that payment. And now with Isaiah being freshly forgiven, being freshly atoned for, he's in the position to accept the urgent mission that God has for him. For the first time in the text, we hear the Lord. We, we've seen the Lord, now we hear the Lord. And in the divine liberation of verse 8, we're told that the Lord says, Who will I send? Who shall go for us? Uh, this is a beautiful picture of the uniqueness of the Christian God. Who shall I, singular, first person, who shall I send? Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord our God, he is one God. Who will we send? Who will go for us? Harkening back to Genesis 1 and probably an indication of the triuneness of God. One God and three persons eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, who are we going to send for this mission? And Isaiah, having seen God, having seen his sin, having confessed his sin, and having had his sin atoned for, he's now in a position to accept the calling on his life. Lord, here I am. Send me. Isaiah doesn't even know the mission yet. And I got news for Isaiah. If you read the rest of chapter 6, it's not a pleasant one. <laughs> Isaiah, you're going to go preach to a people, and they're not going to pay attention to you. Now, I feel Isaiah sometimes because I preach some places that they didn't pay attention to me. Uh, Isaiah, you're going to preach, and, and they're going to shut their hearts off to you. But Isaiah, this is why I have created and redeemed you. And Isaiah says, all right, send me. Uh, now, thankfully, our mission is a little bit different. Our, our, our message is different than Isaiah's message. But it's not all that different because as we go here, there, and everywhere preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, we too preach to people who turn their ears from us. They want their ears tickled, but they don't want their ears having the gospel in them. Uh, they shut their hearts off to us. They want to be encouraged, but they don't want to hear the gospel of Christ. So, so we get somewhat of a sense of it, but this is an altogether different mission. Now, we could close our Bibles here and say we've gone through Isaiah 6, and we could walk out of here knowing that there has been nothing Christian about this message at all. If you leave it there, this has been nothing but an Old Testament commentary. We can't leave it there because the Bible doesn't leave it there. If you were to go to John chapter 12, you would learn that John tells us that when the prophet Isaiah wrote, he was writing about none other than the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That in Isaiah 6, we see the picture of a glory, holy God. And who is this glory-filled, holy God? It is Jesus Christ. He is the glorious, majestic God. He is the holy God. He is the one, according to Revelation, that these angelic beings are going to fly around for all eternity shouting His greatness and His otherness. He is this holy God that when He shows up, the mountains and the temples quake and they fill up with smoke. He is this holy God. But not only that, Jesus Christ is not just the holy God of Isaiah 6, but he is the substitutionary sacrifice. Did you read Isaiah 6 and notice that not once were we told why that coal was hot? We weren't told once what had just been offered up on the sacrifice to, to make that coal hot and to offer forgiveness for Isaiah's sins. It's because that sacrifice hadn't come yet. He showed up in a little town called Bethlehem. 
And the sacrifice was paid when he was nailed on a Roman tree. And he took the full holy justice of God upon himself. He observed the woe of Isaiah upon himself. The cursing we deserve for our sin upon himself. And now because he's taken the cursing, we get his blessing. That's the gospel of Jesus in Isaiah 6, that Jesus Christ is the holy God who comes to earth to take away the guilt of our sin and to offer up atonement through being our substitutionary sacrifice. Through his resurrection, we are not touched with a hot coal. We are touched with the cross of Christ. And when we look to the cross, when our hearts are cauterized by the cross of Christ, We will live forever in glory with this holy God. No longer fearing him, no longer trembling before him as those who are on the outside, but bowing the knee before him as our forever king. This is our God. This is our Christ. And in a time of transition for First Baptist Church, Prattville, Alabama, more than methods, more than answers to questions, We need a vision of God. Today, if you have never seen this glory God, if you have never seen this holy God, today, if you have and you sense the weightiness of your guilt and your sin, would you run to the substitutionary sacrifice who died in your place? His name is Jesus. Look upon Jesus and be saved even right now. And today, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have seen this God, confess your sins, received his atonement, here's the question. On what mission has God sent you on? When's the last time you shared the glorious message of the gospel with a friend or a co-worker or a neighbor? We've got short-term mission trips out the wazoo around here. When are you going to go on one? Who are you going to share the gospel with at the beach this week when your family's on vacation? When you're at the Winn-Dixie later this afternoon, who are you going to tell about this glorious gospel? Because if this really is God... He is worthy. He is worthy through our cauterized lips to speak the message of salvation. Let's pray together. Our great and our glorious God, we thank you that you have given us a vision of yourself. And we thank you that you are full of glory, that you are holy, that you are righteous. And God, we thank you that even when we see you and we sense our sin that you have provided for us through the cross of your son, Jesus. So now in this moment, move by your spirit in our hearts. Show us our sin and show us our Savior for your glory and for our salvation. And for those of us who are saved, who are in Christ, would you give us a renewed zeal for the mission that you're sending us on. We pray this for your glory and our good. Amen. Let's stand. And once you come and be prayed for or receive Jesus today. Let's, we're going to get in the right key, okay? <laughs> Jesus is Savior, 296. Hold on just a second. <laughs> Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life. I hold my glory, my own. Wonderful master in joy and in strife, on him you too may fall. Jesus is Lord.
Thank you. Won't you be seated? Wow, what a great crowd today. And thank you so much, Pate, for that tremendous message. Uh, I know that you were blessed by being here today. I want to take just a moment to run through a couple of quick announcements uh, we'll, before I turn this over to Carl. Uh, we've got a lot of things going on with missions right now, and I hope you'll be praying. We've got a group in Scotland right now that's uh, working with ESL uh, in a very unchurched um, country. Also, we had a group that left for Honduras, and uh, they're working with an orphanage down there. And then uh, beginning on Tuesday, I believe, we've got a group headed to Whitefish, Montana, with a church that we partner with up there. So I hope you'll be praying for uh, these groups that are on mission. Also, we have students going to Sanford for Super Summer this week, so be in prayer for them as well. Um, Coming up on July 24th, we're going to have a family fun night in our west parking lot at 6 p.m. Everything will be outside. Uh, we'll have uh, games. We'll have uh, food. Uh, we'll have a lot of fun that night. Some people have asked, are we going to try to reboot VBS? No. Uh, we <laughs> that way lies madness. Uh, we're just not going to be able to do that this year, but we just are trusting that God can do in two days uh, what, you know, what we couldn't do in a lifetime, so we're, uh, we're just trusting God with that. Uh, then uh, Laura Neal Smith uh, passed away this past week, and her funeral will be uh, tomorrow at uh, Prattville Memorial, uh, visitation from 1130 to 12, and then the memorial service will be at noon. Uh, I want to close our worship time in prayer, and then as soon as I'm through praying, uh, Carl Soleil, our Chairman of our deacons and moderator will come to open up our business meeting. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much just that you are beyond our understanding. And God, as much as we want to know you, as much as we like to, we realize the only way we can do that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because it was in Jesus that you came down to us. And God, you're glory, your magnificence, your holiness is beyond our understanding. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But God, in spite of that, you love us. And you provided a way for us to be with you through Jesus. So Father, the seeds of the gospel message that was preached this morning, Lord, uh, we trust Holy Spirit to do the work of uh, plowing up that soil uh, in fertile hearts, God, that that might bear fruit, and we see people come to Christ. Father, thank you such, so much for this weekend where we've had an opportunity to get to know uh, Peyton and Jordan Lee. And uh, God, just now we pray your will be done. Uh, thank you so much for the work of our search team. Thank you so much for the prayers of your church, God. But above all, Lord, we want Jesus to be glorified. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Carl. Last week, the church was called into a special business meeting uh, to address a recommendation, a nomination from our search committee. Um, after, it, after hearing the motion and after a uh, significant time of questions and comments, uh, I recessed that meeting until this morning. So I'm calling that meeting back to order at this time. Um, as you heard from Peyton, repetition means something's important. Please don't post whatever the result is this morning on social media. Uh, if we call Peyton, he needs to be the first one to tell his church, and he can't do that till Wednesday. 
So please be very, very sensitive of that church right now. A um, couple things I want to share with you before we start. Number one, every member of the church is entitled to vote at all elections. So this is church business. If you are a visitor, um, watch, uh, see what we do, see how we conduct business. But it is the members of the church that are here to vote. Number two, election of a pastor is by standing vote. So when the time comes to vote, I'm going to ask the people for calling Peyton to stand. And after we determine the numbers there, then I will ask the people that are against the motion to stand. Um, in order to call Peyton, it requires a 75% affirmative vote. So at this time, I'm gonna call Jeremy uh, Morgan up to read the motion, and then we will proceed with the vote. Thank you, Carl. As a result of the search and agreement of the church's pastor search team, we move that First Baptist Church Prattville call Peyton Hill as its next senior pastor pursuant to the compensation and benefits package mutually agreed upon by the personnel committee and the candidate with his pastorate to begin on or about August 18th, 2019. Thank you, Jeremy. I've asked Greg Gray, uh, the vice chair of the deacons, to be up here with me as we uh, consider this vote. So at this time, I'd like to ask everyone, every member who is in favor of calling Peyton Hill to be our next senior pastor, everyone who will affirm this motion to please stand. You may be seated. Now I will give an opportunity for anyone who is opposed to this motion to call Peyton Hill as our next senior pastor. Please stand. All right, with that, I'm going to again recess our meeting until the next hour.